Hello everyone, welcome to the second webinar in our series on gene drives. Um, we had the first webinar last Tuesday by Ricardo Steinbrecher. Um, these webinars are organized by four organizations of independent scientists, a European one, a Swiss one, and a French one, and a German one. Um, I won't name them all, that will take too long, but you've seen them in the invitation. Um, these four organizations of ours um, wrote a scientific report about gene drives two years ago and presented it last year at a symposium in Bern. Um, and that included all the aspects of gene drives, the technology, the science, the applications, the subject of today, the social issues, the ethical issues, and the regulatory issues. And we're having one webinar on each of these topics um, this week and the next two weeks. This is the second one on the applications. We have Mark Wells. Welcome, Mark, from Hi. Econexis in Oxford as a speaker today. He is one of the co-authors of the report that we published. And um, um, as I said, he'll be explaining what gene drives are intended to be used for. Um, Ricarda Steinbrecher in the first webinar two days ago explained very briefly, um, I'll, I'll summarize it very briefly, I mean what gene drives are. For those of you who have missed that, um, very briefly, uh, engineered gene drives, synthetic gene drives are a new form of genetic modification, a form of genetic modification that does not just modify one plant or animal but a whole population of them at a time, at once, in the wild. So it's really not engineering or modifying just one animal or plant, but it's really modifying evolution almost. Um, and apart from modifying, uh, changing a property of an animal or plant, of a population of animals or plants, you can also kill a whole population of animals or plants at a time. The idea of, of making gene drives is not new, but it has been made possible by the no novel technique of genetic engineering called CRISPR-Cas, um, which you may have heard of in the newspapers. Uh, it's, I think, nearly 10 years old now, um, or just over 10 years. And, um, um, well, she explained how the synthetic gene drives work. Um, I can't repeat that very briefly, that's impossible. But she also talked about the limitations and uncertainties, which are very important, uh, about the ecological and evolutionary aspects. And the important thing is that uh, they cannot be tested because um, how they work can only be seen under real life conditions. And you can't imitate real life in a lab. Um, and that presents a dilemma that is unique to gene drives because as Ricarda said in her last words in the webinar, even if they work as intended, it doesn't mean they aren't a problem. And even if they do not work as intended, it still doesn't mean they aren't a problem. I dare say Mark will be happy to link into that. Mm -hmm. um, if you have questions, um, please write them in the Q&A box. You'll find that at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you move the cursor to the bottom of your window, you'll see a Q&A button. If you press that, you can write a question there. And at the end of Mark's talk, um, we'll read the questions and Mark will answer them. When you ask a question, please state your name as well. Uh, it may appear automatically if you have already filled in your name, but if you haven't yet, please add your name to the question. Um, that's one thing. Another thing I should say is that um, we keep your webcams switched off in order to save energy. Uh, all the digital activities that people have take quite a lot of energy and this is one way we, we like to, to save a bit of energy. Um, I think that's all. Mark will speak for about three quarters of an hour, you said, is that right? Something like that, yeah. And then there's time for questions. So, um, also, 
Mark stressed that if you really don't understand him, can't follow him, say so in the Q&A box or even in the chat box. And I'll tell Mark and I'll interrupt him and ask him to say something again. So please interrupt through the chat box or the Q&A box if necessary. Okay? With that, I'd like to give the word to Mark. Okay, thank you, Diedrich. So this is my first webinar, so I'm kind of working this out as I go. Um, that okay so hopefully you can all see my first first slide now um yeah so this is quite a strange experience doing web and i've done some talks in universities before and um yeah what's nice when you can see your audience is you can see when uh, people aren't following you um you get a kind of confused look and some some muttering um yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go through quite a lot today. And um, as Diedrich said, you know, if, if something is really not clear, then just say something in the chat box. And if a few people say something, then I'll, I'll stop and go over it a different way. Um, so I'm going to talk today about you know, what the problems are that gene drives are intended to solve, um, the applications, if you like, and what are the risks if we do decide to go down the route of using gene drives um, in these various different fields that people are looking at. Um, so this is all about putting gene drives into a real world context. So in doing this and exploring this, I really want to you know, look at these underlying questions of why is there so much interest in gene drives? Why is there so much investment going into this technology? Um, and given all this investment, um, all this energy going into developing it, it has a certain momentum behind it. Um, and yeah, if, if it does turn out that we end up using gene drives, uh, end up releasing gene drive organisms, what risk does this bring? So I'm going to start out by um, having a look at what gene drives do, reiterating a bit really what Ricardo was talking about on Tuesday, um, how do they work. I'm then going to look broadly at which species do they actually work in so far uh, and which species are people trying to get gene drives to work in. Um, and then I'll look in more detail at a few examples of applications that are proposed. Um, I'll be looking at mice, um, mosquitoes, agricultural pests and also briefly at the possibility of military use of gene drives. So just to look then uh, quickly at what, what are gene drives. So um, the term gene drive actually can mean a few different things, but perhaps the simplest way of thinking about it is to think of a gene drive as a section of genetic material, um, DNA, which is inherited in an unusual way. So for most sexually reproducing organisms, um, genetic material, uh, any particular piece of genetic material has a, a 50% chance of being passed on to any individual offspring um, and this is called Mendelian inheritance and uh, many of you I guess will have learned about this in school um, and the critical thing about um, the genetic material that composes a gene drive is that it has a much higher inheritance rate close to a hundred percent so what this means is that virtually all of the offspring of a organism carrying gene drive genetic material will inherit this gene drive and they will do this even if the gene drive brings no fitness advantage uh, in evolutionary terms and then the effect then over many generations is that this um, engineered genetic material drives through a breeding population um, until it's present in most most of the individuals or all the individuals even within that breeding population. I think this is quite well described by the French term for gene drives, which translates as genetic forcing. Um, I think that paints a picture of uh, what we are doing with this technology, what, we're, what people are proposing to do with this technology. 
So to illustrate this, um, imagine a, a mutant gene appears in a, in a plant. Um, so this, this mutant gene would have a 50-50 a chance of being passed on to any offspring of this plant when it reproduces sexually. So here we have our mutant carrying plant. Uh, and then in the next generation, so it has two offspring, one of them carries the gene, the mutant gene, one does not. In, then in the next generation, it has a 50% chance of being passed on and so on. And so what we see is that this, this mutant, uh, mutant gene does not become more abundant in the population. And if it makes the plant less fit, less likely to reproduce, then it will eventually be um, appear from the population. If, however, a plant carries uh, gene-derived genetic material, then this is plant passed on to nearly 100% of the offspring sexually. Um, and then same happens in the next generation and the next generation. So the effect is that eventually this gene drive material is found in all organisms or virtually all organisms within the breeding population. And this would apply to plants and animals and uh, insects or any other organism where a gene drive could be um, successfully engineered in a lab. So, Terminology around gene drives has got a bit confusing, um, particularly very recently. Um, and I, I want to just, um, just, yeah, I'd like, like to just talk briefly about terminology. Maybe not the most exciting subject, but I think it will help uh, help you when you're um, trying to understand what you read about gene drives. So, um, so the term gene drive is originally coined to describe engineered or synthetic genetic sequences that display this non-Mendelian inheritance. Um, however, some genetic material found in nature also shows non-Mendelian inheritance. And this has been known about by scientists for some time. Um, in fact, it uh, is, you like it, it, if you like, it gave the idea for, for engineered gene drives. And there were various terms for this um natural genetic material that shows non-mendelian inheritance um selfish genetic element was was one quite common term um transposable element sometimes is, is a particular form of it however quite confusingly some people in the research community are now calling these these natural selfish genetic elements gene drives and so we've ended up in a situation where the same term is being used for engineered um gene drives and for, for natural selfish genetic elements. I, I think this is quite confusing. In this talk, where I'm talking about gene drives, I'm talking about synthetic gene drives. I'd also like to introduce the term gene drive organisms. So uh, I think this is a really helpful term because in talking about gene drives, one often has the impression one is talking about little chunks of DNA. Um, however, outside of a lab, genetic material is, is not often found just floating around. Genetic material exists inside living organisms. And this is true of synthetic gene drives as well. Synthetic gene drives not just float around as disembodied bits of DNA. They exist within inside living organisms. And so the term gene drive organism is a helpful reminder of the fact that gene drives um, only really exist in a, a meaningful way inside living creatures. So what might gene drive organisms do? Um, what, what, what's the intention behind them, if you like? Um, so one intention, as Diedrich's already mentioned, is that gene drive organisms could be used to crash or suppress populations of, of wild species um, that for some reason someone finds undesirable um, and they could do this broadly in two ways um, firstly by spreading sterility genes um, they could um, so i can think of one example in mosquitoes where a gene drive has been engineered to spread genes that cause 
female mosquitoes to be infertile. Um, another way that gene drives could suppress populations is by biasing sex ratios. So this means instead of having a 50-50 ratio of male and females, um, gene drives somehow interfere with that ratio. And you know, in one system that's been shown to work in a lab, you can bias the sex ratio of insects towards males. So you have, have a largely male population and eventually that population will crash. A second way in which gene drives could be used is to, to genetically modify or even similarly replace wild populations with, with genetically modified populations. And there's different reasons this could be done. One might be to introduce new genes, completely new genes into a, into a wild population. So imagine with a insect disease vector, say a mosquito, um, you might introduce genes to say, um, cause that insect to carry a, carry a disease or pathogen, if you like, give the insect some level of immunity to, to a, a pathogen that could infect humans. Uh, so you, you might perhaps modify mosquitoes to interfere with transmission of say dengue virus. Um, another way that populations could be modified would be to alter existing genes. So imagine you have an insect that's resistant to a, a pesticide, um, has evolved to be resistant to a pesticide. Um, so you could then undo that that um, resistance, if you like, so spread a, uh, um, a, a, a natural um, or what you might call wild type genetic makeup through a population um, to counteract that, that evolved insecticide resistance. So there's a number of ways in which gene drives could be employed to either suppress or modify wild uh, organisms. So I want to look now at which uh, taxa and species uh, gene drives have so far been shown to work with. Uh, it's quite, quite limited the, the number of species that um, the technology has been shown to work in so far. Um, so back in 2015, um, there was um, the first example of a, a gene drive that um, uh, a synthetic gene drive um, working in, a, in an insect. So uh, in this laboratory model insect, Drosophila melanogaster, um, a, a, a gene drive was demonstrated that um, modified a population in a lab and, and made them all yellow um, over the course of several generations. Similarly, in the same year, a, a gene drive was demonstrated in a lab that could modify a population of yeast uh, in that context, laboratory strain of yeast, um, baker's yeast or brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And in the, in the years since then, gene drives have been shown to, um, or synthetic gene drives have been shown to work in a number of other insect species and other species of fruit fly and three species of uh, mosquitoes now, um, two malaria carrying mosquitoes and another uh, mosquito Aedes aegypti, which is a yellow fever mosquito. So, so far we know that gene drives can work in insects and they can work in fungi. The question of whether gene drives can work in mammals is one that's attracting a great deal of interest and it's extremely uncertain if they can work in mammals um, to any great extent. So last year, um, some research was published showing that a gene drive can operate in mice at very limited efficiency. So it only operates in, in what you might call a female germline. So uh, the gene drive element becomes more abundant in females. And the inheritance rate was about 70, 75% or so, rather than 100%. And it didn't operate down the male germline. So, so far, the jury's out on if 
gene drives can be made to operate um, effectively in mice. Um, and since mice are kind of used as a sort of laboratory um, proxy, if you like, for other mammals, um, if they don't work in mice, they may well, they, they may well not work in, in other mammals. Um, but equally, more years of research, uh, it's possible that they, they could be made to work in mice. So I want to move on now to looking at, at the motivations behind gene drive research. So a lot of work so far has been about finding kind of proof of principle that these things can operate in, in a lab. Um, however, more and more research is moving on to focus on developing gene drives with a particular purpose in mind. Some of this research is, is, is um, well-intentioned, I would say, around um, interruption of disease transmission. Um, whether it delivers the results people promise or not is another question, but the, that is a, the intention of at least some gene drive research. However, it's, it's becoming clearer and clearer as time goes on that a, a very important motivation of this research is around suppressing and controlling agricultural pests. Um, more and more um, research is coming out uh, with, with this, this intention behind it. And I'll come on to that more. Uh, there's also a lot of a lot of talk of using gene drives to control invasive species, um, and again, uh, yeah, it may be possible for some insect species. Um, uh, I, I, I'm still unsure how possible it will be for mammals. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how that develops, um, or indeed if it's decided that any of this is remotely appropriate. Um, okay, so first to look at insects, at the range of insects that um, are either the subject of existing research to, um, to develop gene drives or have been proposed as gene drive targets in the future. Um, I think all of these insects I've listed here, there is active research underway either to build gene drives or to do the preliminary work um, before building a gene drive so to for example sequence the genome or to um, develop the molecular biology tools needed to, to build the gene drive um, so there's these three mosquito species that i've mentioned earlier gene drives have now been constructed in all three of these um, and the intention behind this is um, really about using these gene drives either to suppress populations or to, or to modify populations to interrupt disease transmission. Um, there's lots of proof of concept work that has gone on in the fruit fly, Drosophila. Um, and uh, more and more in the literature now, we're, we're seeing preliminary work, uh, sequencing genomes, um, developing molecular biology tools in agricultural pests and in, in the literature these, these uh, researchers working on this are, are saying that the intention behind this or one of the intentions behind it is to construct gene drives and um, it's all at an early stage um, or relatively early stage with the exception of spotted one winged Drosophila uh, which is quite a major insect pest where a, there is an example of a, a functional gene drive that has been constructed in that organism. Whether it's a functional one that could actually be employed to achieve any sort of pest control in the wild is, is another question, but nevertheless a gene drive has been built in that organism. Mark, can I just interrupt you briefly? Sure, yeah. Um, because uh, Sigurna Müller asks, um, what do you mean the drive can work? This has really been answered by Ricarda already, but she says, what are additional criteria in addition to sexual reproduction and work if you really need a wild population to drive the trait? Okay, yeah, all right, that's a really good question. So um, when I say work, what I mean is that um, a drive can work to some extent in a laboratory, can, can drive uh, genetic changes through a laboratory population, 
of the particular target species. No gene drive has yet been released in the wild and it's very uncertain how gene drives would behave if they were released in the wild. Um, so you can imagine scenarios where um, some form of resistance to a gene drive uh, emerges very, very quickly in the wild, um, either at a molecular level or, or through behavior, and the, the, the GM organisms just disappear. Um, that's one scenario you could imagine. Um, you could imagine scenarios where no resistance evolves and the gene drive just spreads uncontrollably in the wild as well. Um, and uh, this is something that Diedrich was alluding to earlier on. What actually happens when any of these things are released is very, very uncertain. Um, and so when I say a gene drive works, what I mean is it has been shown to work to a greater or lesser extent in, in a laboratory setting. Yeah, yeah. The question really points to the big dilemma of gene drives, doesn't it? Mm, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a great deal of uncertainty really about what will happen when, if, uh, let's say, if these things are never ever released. I'll come on to that a bit more later. Okay, thanks for going on, Mark. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, so it's interesting to look at, um, you know, outside of insects, there's quite a few other species that have been suggested as gene drive targets and progress on all of these is, uh, in, in laboratory settings is at quite an early stage. Um, so, um, yeah, so gene drives has been suggested as a way of controlling invasive species, both lionfish and the uh, common starling in Australia. Um, it's unclear. I think uh, the, the starling is just a suggestion in the literature. The lionfish, um, it's unclear if any research is underway or not. Um, similarly, gene drives have been suggested as, as a way of controlling the snails that spread uh, Bilharzia. Um, and again, it's, um, I, I'm unclear from, from uh, the, the research I've done how far this has progressed. Um, you know, maybe that there's, there's funded research now going on on this target. Um, there definitely is uh, a lot of lab research going on in gene drives in nematode worms, in the um, laboratory nematode C. elegans. Um, and this is really about establishing um, kind of proof of concept for new gene drive designs. It's an easy organism to work with in the lab. Um, if gene drives do work in nematodes, um, then uh, there are proposals and I, I think funding has been allocated for, for these ideas to use gene drives as a way of controlling um, uh, basically pathogenic nematodes, soil transmitted helminths that um, cause, cause disease in the tropics. So last of all in my kind of survey of which species are being targeted I wanted to come on to mammals. Um, so all of the kind of proof of concept work is going on in, in mice. Um, I think it's likely that if gene drives ever were to be shown to work in mice, they'd quickly be um, uh, exploited in rats as well. Um, and the, the motivations behind this, as, as we'll come on to, are partly about pest control and partly about invasive species control. Um, similarly, there are proposals out there um, to use. Um, gene drives control a number of invasive species, mainly species that are a problem in Australia, and some preliminary work is going on, for example, sequencing genomes of wild cats um, to sort of lay the, lay the ground for, for building gene drives uh, to target them, should, should gene drives ever work in mammals. Um, so with the kind of caveat in mind that it's highly uncertain if any of this will be realized. I, I want to look a bit more at uh, what, what would be the implications of um, using gene drives to control house mice. Um, so if gene drives can work in mammals, probably the first mammal they would be used in would be house mice. Um, so I want to kind of step back now and focus our minds not just on gene drives but on I suppose the fact that all 
animals in the wild exist in a, in a context. So they um, exist in relationship to other animals and, and in relationship to an ecosystem. So the house mouse, um, Mus musculus, originated in India um, and spread out of India, so believed. And um, somewhere in the, in the Middle East, about 10,000 years ago, the house mouse started becoming a commensal organism um, of humans. That's that meant that the house mouse lived around human habitations and kind of fed off our, our waste food and um, uh, scavenged from, a, um, from human agriculture and so on. Um, and this uh, ability to live alongside humans um, has led the house mouse to become one of the most widely distributed vertebrates on the planet. Um, so um, as humans have spread around the world, house mice have spread, house mice have spread, spread alongside us. Uh, and so to look at the distribution of house mice, um, they're now found on every continent other than Antarctica um, and in a vast range of habitats. Um, so these habitats would include um, human habitats in houses and farms and other human buildings um, and also on grasslands, shrublands and some wetlands. So it's a very, very um, adaptable species and it's adaptable um, partly because it's nivorous. Um, house mice can eat all, eat all sorts of different um, foodstuffs and it's also managed to reach all of these habitats uh, because they have a huge capacity to stow away on um, ships or on other human transportation. So humans were interested in controlling house mice for two main reasons. So first of all because house mice um, impact on agricultural yields and scavenge from food stores and secondly and more recently because house mice have become quite an important invasive species on various islands around the world where they upset island ecosystems in various ways by uh, preying on insects and also uh, in some extreme cases even preying on seabird chicks and so um, the agenda or, or, the, or the, the apparent agenda behind a lot of research in developing gene drugs control house mice is to eliminate house mice from um, from islands where they become a problem. Um, in the back of our minds, I think we should you know, remember that all of this could also be applied to uh, controlling house mice where they, um, for example, impact on grain harvests and uh, there'd be a lot more money involved in, uh, in that application. So to, to set house mice in the, in the context of the ecosystems that they live in. So whilst they might be an invasive species in many contexts, um, they play an important role. They, um, they prey off a variety of insects and other invertebrates, flies, spiders, beetles, bugs, caterpillars, and so on. Um, and then in some contexts, um, they, their, their diet is mainly grain um, and it's even possible that they may play a role in seed dispersal. Um, so they also provide prey for a huge number of different creatures, cats, foxes, wolves, mongooses, uh, birds of prey. And um, what's I suppose not clear is just how important they are as prey for each of these different species in different contexts. So, um, you know, from my reading into this topic, you know, what can be seen is that we only really know how important house mice are in certain very narrow contexts where they've been studied. So, for example, you know, for wolves in Italy, they're a very small part of their diet, but for birds of prey in certain cities, um, house mice are a very large part of their diet. And if we were suddenly develop some uh, very powerful new tool for removing house mice from a, a given area, um, it's important to bear in mind that this would have knock-on effects. You know, we may suddenly find that we've um, we've reduced our owl population or our hawk population, 
So what are the risks and uncertainties of um, using gene drives to control mice if, if this should ever be a, a possibility? Well, if gene drives could be used to remove invasive mice from an island, well, that's all very well. But as I already mentioned, then mice are very, very good at stowing away. And this is, in fact, how they've managed to invade a lot of islands in the first place. So if we had gene drive modified mice suppressing invasive mice on an island, it's very possible that those mice might escape and end up on the mainland. And what we might end up end with, what we then might end up with is um, gene drive mice suppressing mainland populations of mice. We might end up with a situation that's um, not within our control. Uh, equally, if gene drive mice were used for pest control on the mainland, um, it's very unclear how you could contain those gene drive mice in any particular area. You know, mice spread easily, they move around easily. What would the ecosystem consequences be of suppressing mice? Um, uh, I've, I've talked about that briefly, that's something we should have in mind. Similarly, and this is a question that's going to come up for probably any gene drive application in the wild, is that there's the possibility for gene drive to move between species. So different subspecies of house mice can interbreed um, and produce fertile offspring. And house mice can even breed with some close relatives in the wild. Um, for example, the Algerian mouse, um, as, uh, another species of mouse mouse um, that they can breed with and produce fertile offspring. And so it's, it's not entirely clear if a gene drive would even stay within one species. Um, similarly, if a gene drive containing gene genome editors like CRISPR-Cas CRISPR -Cas were released, um, say the mice became resistant to that drive, so it um, was it became ineffective at suppressing their populations, you'd still have genetically modified mice carrying a genome editor uh, out in the wild, and the long-term effects of that would be um, uh, be very hard to predict. So again, uh, stepping back a bit from the, the focus on using gene drives to control mice, um, with all of these applications that we're talking about, including mice, we need to be aware of the, the fact that there's, there's different options available to solve the problems that gene drives are intended to solve. So um, I'm sure I don't need to list uh, existing ways of controlling mice, uh, which have been around for a very long time. Um, but in terms of removing mice from uh, islands, um, the poisons have been used very successfully, toxicants. Um, there are legitimate animal welfare concerns about this. However, mice have been successfully removed from hundreds of islands using toxicants. Um, uh, in, I think it was 2018, the um, successful clearance of South Georgia, which is a very large island, um, three and a half thousand square kilometers, um, was, was announced. Um, so that island is now mice and rat free. Um, and so very substantial conservation gains have been achieved using existing methods on islands. As far as protecting agriculture goes, um, uh, methods of rodent control are always evolving. Um, there are methods called ecologically based rodent management that employ new knowledge about rodent behaviour um, um, to, to control rodents in that setting. And similarly, in terms of controlling rodents where they're an invasive species, um, self-resetting traps are being explored as an option in New Zealand. There's um, apparently some promising work in that field. So. For, for, for this particular um, application of gene drives, there, 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 there are other alternatives that at the very least should be looked at. So I want to move on now to looking at the proposal to use gene drives in mosquitoes. Um, 
so mosquitoes are mainly of interest to humans um, because they're vectors of diseases, diseases like malaria, dengue, yellow fever, and so on. And around about 160 to 190 species, um, based on my reading, um, have been shown to uh, act as disease vectors or vectors for human diseases. In the same way as how we looked at mice, I want to step back and consider mosquitoes embedded in ecosystems. Um, so across the globe, we have about three and a half thousand species of mosquitoes and new ones are being discovered all the time. And these species perform a variety of different functions within the, uh, the ecosystems they live in. Um, they feed on aquatic microbes. Um, in one case, uh, mosquito has been shown to act as a pollinator and there could be more. Uh, they play a role in nutrient and detritus recycling. And they provide prey both as larvae and as um, adults uh, in the different ecosystems that they live in. And we'll have a look a bit more at that now. So how might gene drives be used in mosquitoes? So there's broadly two different proposals. Um, one is that gene drives could be used to suppress mosquito populations. There's a, uh, a very big project called Target Malaria that's proposing to um, suppress the African malaria mosquito, Anopheles gambiae, using gene drives. That's funded by Bill and Melinda Gates, a huge investment going in there. Um, equally, there are proposals to uh, modify mosquito populations to make them less capable of transmitting diseases. Um, and there's uh, work going on um, mainly in California looking at um, how uh, Aedes aegypti or the, um, the Indian malaria mosquito, Anopheles stephensi, could be modified to prevent disease transmission. So I'm going to focus uh, more here on the proposal for population suppression um, because I think that the technology in this case is, is a little more advanced um, from what I've seen of the literature. And so when we're, we're looking at possible impacts of mosquito gene drives, this the possibility of population suppression is what I have in the back of my mind. So, as I've mentioned, mosquitoes um, act as vectors for a number of different human diseases. And without going into the detail of this table, um, the important point here is that, um, so we know that say about 200 um, species of mosquitoes act as vectors. Um, but um, What's not clear to me from my reading um, is that um, all these other species of mosquitoes, um, uh, other mosquitoes among these three and a half thousand mosquitoes, could any of these evolve to feed on humans and then evolve to be um, vectors of disease? Um, so it's unclear of the capacity of all these other species to, to spread disease. So my concern really is how many species, mosquito species, could end up being targeted if we decide we want to go down this route of using gene drives to target mosquitoes. Um, so we might target just a handful of you know, very dangerous disease vectors. Um, we might target all disease vectors. It might then be that more mosquitoes occupy the empty niches left by the disease vectors that have been suppressed, and that these mosquitoes evolve into new disease vectors. Um, it's also um, quite possible that mosquitoes that feed on humans, because humans are a very abundant species, might be among the more abundant mosquito species. This is something that I think we need a lot more clarity on. And so when you look at the target malaria um, kind of publicity material, they, 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 they claim their intention is just to target you know, one or two mosquito species. Um, I think what we need to be really clear about is just how many, what fraction of wild mosquitoes could be impacted by gene drives. Um, 
because I'm, I'm very unclear um, where where this could take us in in the long term. Just how many mosquitoes or what a proportion of wild mosquitoes could be impacted by this. And so, with this in mind, that gene drives might give us the capacity to um, suppress um, a significant fraction of the wild mosquito population in some parts of the world. Let's have a look at the um, the role that mosquitoes play in the ecosystems. So, mosquitoes have a life cycle where they start out as larvae and then they, they grow into adult insects. Um, and these larvae do all sorts of different things. Um, larvae feed off aquatic microsystems, uh, sorry, aqua aquatic microbes. And there's a whole kind of ecosystem of aquatic microbes in every, um, uh, in every environment that the larvae live in. There's, there's kind of predator microbes and there's smaller photosynthetic microbes. And what's been observed is that when mosquito larvae are removed from certain ecosystems, this whole ecosystem of microbes is kind of upset. It changes. Some become more abundant, some become less, less abundant. And that's because um, the, the larvae are kind of top predators within this kind of microscopic world. So if these larvae were suddenly to be removed by a gene drive, we'd see changes in the microbes in the uh, aquatic environments that the, the larvae live in. And what would be the consequences of that is, is very hard to tell. Similarly, larvae play a role in recycling um, decaying organic material. So uh, um, they, they feed off this decaying detritus and then it, uh, that has the effect of recycling nitrogen and other minerals back into the ecosystem. So there's a role they play there. They act as food for a whole variety of different species, beetles, water bugs, flies and spiders, fish, tadpoles. There's even some spiders that are adapted to uh, preying off Particular, mos uh, particular mosquito species. Again, adult mosquitoes uh, support a range of species, dragonflies and damselflies, spiders, birds, bats. And what's also unclear is their role in pollination. So adult mosquitoes mainly fe feed off nectar. And as I've said, there's at least one mosquito species that has been shown to be a pollinator in, um, uh, in the Arctic environment. But a lot of pollinators for flowering plants aren't known. So it's perfectly possible that um, mosquitoes could act as pollinators for other flowering plants. And we just don't know about it. So there's a lot of unknown quantities in any, uh, any attempt to suppress mosquitoes from wild ecosystems. What we do know uh, from efforts to suppress mosquitoes in France in the Camargue um, is that when mosquitoes and midges are suppressed um, you do see some ecological effects. So um, a selective toxin called BTI has been used um, in these wetlands in France uh, and What's been observed by ecologists is that um, where mosquito and midge populations are reduced, you then see reductions in the clutch sizes and the survival of um, house martin chicks. Uh, and that's clearly because mosquitoes uh, prey for house martins and because they're prey for larger insects like damselflies and dragonflies that are also prey for house martins. So there's some sort of effect going on there through the food chain. Similarly, again, this is data from the Camargue, where mosquitoes and midges are suppressed using BTI. We see reductions in the populations and the, um, the species diversity of dragonflies and damselflies. And again, these are both species that, that feed off mosquitoes and midges. So Diedrich's already alluded to the various unpredictable effects or unpredictable consequences, you might say, of releasing gene drive organisms. So 
as we've heard, if a suppression gene drive works exactly as planned, stays exactly where it's supposed to, stays in the species it's supposed to, there will be ecological effects. Um, but one of the biggest questions on my mind is this huge uncertainty about what happens when a gene drive is released. So it's very unclear if there could be any ways of effectively containing a gene drive within a given geographic area. And so one huge uncertainty is how far a gene drive would spread and how widely populations would be suppressed. It's unclear if gene drives will stay in one species. Um, so mosquitoes, like other species, can breed with close relatives and in some cases produce fertile offspring. And so there's a clear mechanism by which gene drives could spread to other species. Um, there's the issue that once a gene drive is released, it's released. You can't get it back in and you therefore have the potential for irreversible effects. Um, in the same way as mice, if you have um, mosquitoes that become resistant to the suppression gene drive but are still carrying um, CRISPR-Cas genome editors, it's very unclear what effects that will have on the mosquito genomes over time. And we also have this potential for what I call, uh, what is called unknown unknown. So um, gene drives are interfering with so many complex systems, um, the molecular biology of a cell, the physiology of an organism, the um, sort of population dynamics of an organism, the ecosystems the organism is embedded in, that there's such complexity in, in each of these layers, let alone all of these layers combined, that there's clear potential for consequences that no one has foreseen at all. Uh, and any of these, um, let's say, uncertainties, you know, any of these um, uncertainties could lead to outcomes that are totally unpredicted or even outcomes that are quite foreseeable, like the drive spreads further than, than was planned. Um, and all of this could lead to further ecological effects. I'm aware I'm just I'm taking longer here than I intended, so I'm going to skip a bit here. Um, so, yeah, just to consider the health benefits of gene drives in mosquitoes or, or the putative health benefits. Um, it's, it's possible that uh, suppressing mosquitoes or modifying mosquitoes using gene drugs could deliver some health benefits. Um, can't rule it out. Um, but it's also quite possible it won't. And there's a number of reasons why that could be the case. Mosquitoes could become resistant to the gene drive in various ways. Um, uh, a molecular level, their, their, their genomes could evolve to be resistant, or they may develop behavioral resistance. They may just not choose not to mate with genetically modified mosquitoes that are released by scientists. In either of these cases, you may see suppression of mosquito population for a while and then the population rebounding, you know, back where you started with the disease. Uh, similarly, if efforts to suppress mosquitoes are successful, it's perfectly possible that new mosquito vectors could occupy empty niches in the environment. With Proposals to modify mosquitoes um, to, to interrupt disease transmission, you could have similar issues with, with resistance to the gene drive and the, and the population could simply remain unmodified exactly as it was before. Similarly, pathogens also evolve. The pathogens that we're trying to interfere with could evolve to spread perfectly well through the genetically modified mosquitoes. So the health uh, benefits that are being claimed for mosquito gene drives are by no means certain. I'm going to skip over that um, other than to just briefly say there's a whole number of other alternative approaches that could be used to control mosquitoes or could be used to control mosquito-borne diseases. So I want to briefly look at the possible use of gene drives in agriculture uh, and this is I think the bigger picture for gene drive research particularly in insects. So crop losses due to pests uh, 
particularly insects and mites, uh, a very substantial um, economic loss globally, uh, something like 9 to 21 percent of um, uh, crops are lost globally through insect pests. Um, but in thinking about this, you know, what I have in the back of my mind is what, what eats these insects. So this humans sort of gain control of this, this um, biomass by growing crops and then it, it moves outside of human control. It's, it's consumed by um, pest insects and they'll be eaten by other things, by birds and other predators. And so all this biomass that is being uh, taken out of the human sphere, if you like, is uh, very likely to be supporting biodiversity in some ways. So let's have that in the back of our minds when we're thinking about gene drives in agriculture. So the most common proposal in the literature for using gene drives in agriculture is simply to suppress insect, press, insect pests, to spread sterility genes or um, bias sex ratios in the same way as being proposed with mosquitoes. There are some proposals to, to modify insect pests, for example, where they've become resistant to pesticides and pesticides and to undo that, um, that resistance. So what are the species that are being proposed as targets? So partly because the first laboratory um, demonstrations of gene drives were in fruit flies, I think that there's a lot of proposals already to target various fruit flies with gene drives. Um, Mediterranean fruit fly, the olive fruit fly, um, and preliminary work is going on to develop the, the tools, if you like, to target uh, major genera, major families of, of, of fruit flies. But it's not just fruit flies that are um, being targeted uh, so far. It's, um, some work has gone on to target the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, uh, as far as I know, that work has hit barriers um, with the molecular biology and it isn't proceeding. Um, there's uh, work coming out in the literature looking at um, how you would design gene drives to target the diamondback moth, which is a big pest of um, brassicas, things like cabbages and cauliflowers and so on. Um, there's preliminary work on genome sequencing to target uh, livestock pests like the Australian sheep blowfly and a couple of other similar organisms. And there's also preliminary work on gene drives to target the red flower beetle. And I'm confident that as, uh, uh, as we go on, we'll see more and more proposals to target um, agricultural press with this technology. So what are the risks and uncertainties uh, in going down this avenue? So there's the ecosystem effects of all of this going exactly to plan, um, which could be very substantial if um, these uh, pest creatures are, are supporting um, biodiversity in the wild. Um, we have a similar set of potential unintended outcomes, uh, similar to the ones I've just talked about in mosquitoes. The gene drives could spread further than planned, they could jump species, you may not be able to reverse them, and so on. However, because I think a much wider variety of species, of families of species, could be targeted by gene drives in agriculture, the potential for gene drives to move into species that are not intended targets uh, is, I would say, greater. Um, so um, I think it's a, it's a big step going from using gene drives um, to target mosquitoes to using gene drives to target a broad spectrum of insect agricultural pests. Um, okay, I'm gonna move quickly over this slide other than to say there's a number of other approaches for controlling insect pests um, and you know we need to have all these in our minds when we're uh, you know or these should be had in mind before committing uh, vast resources to developing gene drives um, and I'd also point out that gene drives go hand in hand with industrial agricultural systems so 
monocultural agricultural uh, way of just growing one crop over very large areas are prone to pests um, and in a way gene drives that could give us a, a I suppose a techno fix to uh, the pests that affect monocultures um, to, to lock in this this system of industrial agriculture so yeah before I finish I'll look briefly at um, one more aspect of gene drives, which is that the possibility of, of, of weaponizing gene drives. So a lot of the investment has gone into this technology so far has become from the US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency or DARPA, at least $65 million in invested in gene drive and genome editing research, possibly quite a bit more. Um, and so why is this? Well, it's not hard to imagine how gene drives could be weaponized. So Imagine a gene drive were designed to target an important insect pollinator and these gene drive insects were released in a, by one state in a rival state's um, uh, territory. So uh, I'm not saying this is what DARPA is thinking of doing, um, but what's clear is that to, to counteract a weaponized gene drive, uh, one would need a more advanced knowledge of gene drives. Um, so one way of counteracting a, a gene drive would be to release a second gene drive to counteract the first gene drive. Uh, it's very easy to see how this could get messy. Uh, another possibility would be releasing genetically modified insects that are resistant to the gene drive, that have perhaps been engineered to be resistant to the actions of genome editors. And so I think what's in the, in the minds of people in DARPA is that to uh, um, defend oneself against gene drives one needs to be one step ahead uh, of one's rivals and it's quite easy to see how this could turn into a sort of um, uh, an arms race if you like or at least competition between different different nations. So just to conclude um, as I've been emphasizing there's many uncertainties about the consequences of gene drive releases if they ever do indeed take place. Um, robust risk assessment um, would be difficult, uh, I think, in all cases for a gene drive release and probably impossible in some cases. And the reason it could be impossible, as has now been pointed out in the literature, is that for a gene drive where there's no way of controlling how far it spreads, is going to affect a very large number of different ecosystems and understanding the consequences of something that modifies a whole range of different ecosystems across vast areas is beyond is, is, is realistically beyond any uh, risk assessment process. So for each of these problems that gene drives are designed to solve there's a number of alternative approaches and um, what I would argue for is that before going down the avenue of researching gene drives all of these alternatives should be evaluated and it's quite possible there may be safer and better options um, uh, as opposed to the gene drive route. So policymakers and the public need informing about gene drives and it's very important that this information about this technology doesn't just come from the, um, the research groups developing them and the organisations funding this, this research. Um, so a lot more thought is needed about where this technology could take us in the long term. Um, essentially, if it works as uh, hoped by its developers, we could end up in a scenario where uh, the human race has a lot more control over wild ecosystems than it currently does. And so we end up with this prospect of uh, what might be called designer ecosystems. And so I think that point to take away from this if, if nothing else is this decision about if collectively we go down this road of uh, exploiting this this technology um, this this question is is too important to be decided on by a small number of people that there needs to be public debate about this issue I'll leave it there thank you very much for your attention Right, thank you very much, Mark. That was a brilliant talk, I think. Um, 
the drawback of webinars is that you don't hear or get any applause but please imagine it uh, i'm sure many will support that